Welcome into Five Wide Fantasy. Today we're getting into second half bus for the fantasy football season. If you guys didn't check out last week's video, we got in some players that can break out as well as some sleepers. I got three players to talk about today that you do want to sell. And if you're going to sell these guys, be sure to watch the videos from last week. Those are going to be some great targets uh, with these players because a couple of these guys, very high profile fantasy assets and a few that have played pretty well so far this season. So again, if you guys enjoyed today's video, would really, really appreciate it if you did hit that like button to let me know. And if you are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. We're hitting you with fantasy football content every single single day to help you win your fantasy leagues. Let's get into these players. First up is Kenneth Walker, the Seattle Seahawks. He's currently RB6 on the season. Big part for that has been his inside the five work. He leads the NFL inside the five carries this season with 14. He's turned those inside the five carries into five touchdowns so far. And last season, this was an area that he really struggled. He had 10 inside the five carries last season for just two touchdowns. He's already surpassed that, looking to go for more than like near 30, which would be incredibly valuable in fantasy football. But we'll get into a little bit more on the schedule in a little bit. But first, we saw Zach Charbonnet get involved this past week with Walker banged up. I think that definitely played a factor. Actor. But the way Pete Carroll was talking about Charbonnet and his performance this past week, he went five, five carries for 53 yards, pitched in with uh, a couple of receptions. He doubled Walker in routes run. The way that P. Walker or that Pete Carroll was talking about Charbonnet seems like you could see him a little bit more involved uh, and potentially maybe not as much as this in the uh, rushing game, but well, probably nearly as much as this if they can get into a decent game script. And that could have an effect on Walker's finished rest of season for sure. Do you think Walker will still be that guy when they get inside the five yard line, but he hasn't been known to convert those opportunities at a super high level. He's doing a decent job so far this, se this season. But what's most important for me when I'm looking at the second half of the season is we have all this information on our hands when it comes to these defenses and how they are against fantasy running backs and how they are against the run. So taking a look at this schedule here, it is very difficult the rest of the season. And I think when I'm looking at what we've had so far with, with Walker, there have been some easier matchups. But you look at the rest of the schedule, he's getting four matchups with top 10 fantasy defenses, those teams being the Los Angeles Rams, San Francisco 49ers twice, and the Philadelphia Eagles, who are also an elite unit. And as well, only one matchup that coming in the fantasy championship game against a team that is bottom 10 in fantasy points allowed to running back. So you might not even make it to that game with Walker to be able to actually benefit from that matchup. And if you're looking at some of these remaining games that are on this schedule, Baltimore, uh, Washington, Dallas, Tennessee, these are teams that are still in the upper half of fantasy points allowed to running backs. And I think for Tennessee in particular and Dallas, these are still top 10, I think, run defenses in the league. Baltimore, I could probably say, this, say the same too. Washington has an excellent front four as well. So as much as these matchups don't look bad on paper, when a, from a fantasy points perspective, these other matchups are really tough as well. And I know San Francisco and Philadelphia will be an elite unit by the end of the season. The same could go with, for the Rams with Aaron Donald. So this schedule is really, really tough, which gives me a lot of concern. And so far this season, four of his seven games have come against teams that have been in the bottom 10 of fantasy points allowed to running back. So he's benefited from a good schedule so far. And if you look at some of the performance so far from Walker, there's nothing that he's doing right now that's like groundbreaking that says, hey, you look at this stat, you look at this number, you look at these opportunities, and this is what's going to separate him rest of season. He's averaging 4.4 yards per carry, 20th at the position, just over three yards after contact per attempt, which is 20th as well. And he isn't doing much to pitch in in the receiving game. 14 receptions ranks 27th amongst running backs. And like I said, Charbonnet, I think, will eat into those opportunities because Walker hasn't known to be much of a receiving back. He's probably playing more of a role this year than he was last season. And Charbonnet profiles much better coming out of UCLA as the guy to be uh, running the routes and getting those receptions. So that could be something that moves away from Walker as well. Those inside the five carries have been where the value is for him. I think we will see less rest of season from him because I think he will struggle to run the football here. So he's an excellent sell for me. And if you're watching the video from last week, there are a couple of guys that are excellent targets when you're using Walker uh, and you're wanting to trade him away too. Next, we move to the wide receiver position with another high profile player is Jalen Waddle of the Miami Dolphins. He's currently the wide receiver 26 in fantasy points so far this season. And I have a few things that I want to touch on when it comes to why I think this is going to be a player that will continue to uh, not be able to meet expectations. Now, could he improve on his wide receiver 26 rating right now? I think that's potentially in play for sure, especially coming off a good week here last week, leading the team in receiving yards and finding the end zone. But I want to first look at the numbers so far this season, how they compare to last season, and then we'll get into what comes for the rest of the second half of the year. So target share seems pretty similar. It is pretty similar to what it was last season. 22.7% target share, which is 28th amongst wide receivers. It's never been in at elite level for, well, sorry, since Tyreek Hill has entered the fold, it hasn't been at an elite level. That's not usually a concern for Waddle. These are the concerns. These are the things that have fallen off from last season. Target 
target depth. So last season, he saw 20 targets of 20 plus air yards for 11 receptions. Not crazy high, pretty reasonable, definitely helpful in a fantasy finish. We need explosive plays. But this season, he's on pace for just 14 deep targets and only less than five receptions. So less than half the amount of catches of 20 plus air yards compared to last season. So that is a problem. Obviously, what Tyreek Hill is doing is definitely impacting Waddle. And it is hard for two guys when one is going to set is on pace to set and shatter receiving records, it's hard for the other guy to continue to be the guy he was from the previous season. And then as well, average depth of target. We've seen you know Tyreek Hill creating a ton of explosive plays, being targeted deep downfield. Waddle has not been the same with, with we mentioned with the deep targets, but also just his average depth of target so far this year. It's down nearly three yards from 12.7 last year to 9.8 this year. And then as well, he's always been an elite yards after the catch player. It's fallen off a little bit compared to last season. It's still at an elite level. He's still top 10 amongst receivers in yards after the catch per reception, but it's down more than a full yard. It was 6.7 last season. It's 5.6 this season. So when you are not dominating target share, you need to be able to create explosive plays, score touchdowns, or be an absolute monster in terms of yards after the catch. And from a season-to-season basis, that isn't all that sustainable. We saw it with Debo Samuel last year, not being able to do some of those things that he did the year prior. And it's happening with Jalen Waddle. So can some of these things improve? Potentially. But when I look at the schedule the rest of the year, which you'll have the chance to look at here now, it's the worst playoff schedule amongst all wide receivers and really pretty close to the worst schedule for the rest of the season amongst all wide receivers. In the fantasy playoffs, he gets the Jets, who are first in fantasy points allowed to wide receivers. He gets the Cowboys, who are fourth. Fourth, and then he gets the Baltimore Ravens, who are third. And six of his final eight games are against top 10 defenses in fantasy points allowed to wide receivers, including another matchup with the Jets, and then as well the Chiefs coming up this week. Now, there are a lot of teams that can, where, where you look at the matchup, and the matchup doesn't matter. You're going to start these wide receivers. They're probably going to be able to produce for you. But the thing is, is with Waddle as being the wide receiver two in this offense, makes this a little bit more concerning for me, where, you know, I think that if Tyreek Hill's healthy, he's the number one option. He will be the hyper-targeted guy and Waddle will be that second guy to go to. And not to say that, you know, Waddle can't produce in these matchups. It's certainly possible. But I think if you're looking at Waddle and his value in your fantasy league, there are some players that you can look to target that would be much more beneficial to you and be be able to produce throughout these next eight, nine weeks that Waddle won't be able to do. So player that I'm looking to do that with, CeeDee Lamb would be excellent. I talked about Brandon Ayuk last week as well. Those two receivers, if you can build a package out that includes Jalen, shipping Jalen Waddle out, plus maybe another piece if you need to, to get one of those two guys, that's what I'd be looking to do because the schedule is really concerning and it's going to be a problem for you in the fantasy playoffs once you get there. And our last player, going back to the running back position, it's Gus Edwards of the Baltimore Ravens. He's currently the running back 17 and half PPR formats right now. So coming off a couple of big weeks and definitely starting to get more into the mix here of these top backs on the season. But when I look at Gus Edwards as a fantasy asset, this is a very game script and matchup dependent back. You can just see it in his previous games this season. We saw big games against Detroit, big games against Arizona. We had a game script where the Ravens were leading by 20 points by like the second quarter of this game against Detroit and then Arizona being another game where they were leading against an Arizona team that also really struggles against the run so far this year. And then you look at his games that he struggled. Struggles against a good run defense in in the Titans. Unable to, like basically unplayable against the Steelers in a game that they lost. If this team is not winning or against a team that's really poor against the run, Gus Edwards is not going to produce for you. And when I look at the remaining schedule, I see a ton of games here where I'm going to not be able to play Gus Edwards. Especially in weeks 14 to 16. That is the last game of your fantasy season, regular season and the quarterfinal and semifinal matchups where he gets top 10 run defenses in Los Angeles, Jacksonville, and San Francisco. And these are teams that I know will continue to be top 10 run defenses by this time of the year. The only matchup he has this season with the remaining part of his fantasy season against a team that's bottom 10 in fantasy points allowed to running backs is Cincinnati. Will the Bengals be that type of team in a couple of weeks? I'm not so sure. The defense is definitely improving. And then you look at some of these teams, again, much like we talked about with Kenneth Walker, some of the teams he plays Um, that aren't in the top 10 that I still think are quality run defenses, Seattle this week. They've been very, very good against the run. The only reason they are not a top 10 unit is because they've given up a few touchdowns to the running back position. Then you look at Cleveland, who's been a solid defense across the board so far this year, and then Los Angeles. The Chargers have actually been pretty solid against the run. It would not shock me to see them potentially in the top 10 by the end of the year because they've been brutal against the pass and they've actually been very solid against the run. We've seen it the last couple of weeks. So I have a lot of concern here for Edwards, especially when you look at the fact that Edwards is not someone 
Tomlin's going to contribute in the receiving game. He's never seen more than two targets in a game this year. He's never, or he's run more than 15 routes just once, I believe. Uh, he ran 18 routes maybe a couple of games ago. So when I look at Edwards as a player, and then I look at the matchups, this isn't a player that's overwhelmingly talented. He was not given this RB1 role to start the season. Obviously, Dobbins' injury gave him this opportunity. This isn't a fantastic talent. These are matchups that I don't think are going to be too good. The schedule gets really tough here for the Ravens, and I think Gus, Gus Edwards will be directly affected by that. And you're coming off of two great weeks. Find the end zone three times last week. I think he scored the week prior as well against Detroit. Yeah, he did find the end zone against Detroit. This is like the best possible time for you to sell high on him. And there's definitely some other players that you can look at at the running back position that have better schedules and are better targets. I did post a sheet here with all of the matchups and whether or not these are top 10, bottom 10, middle of the road matchups. I did post that on my Twitter. And then as well, we talked about it last week with some of those running backs. So be sure to check out that video. You can also drop me a follow on Twitter. It's at Tyler Killip. Those are my three running backs that I do think you should be selling and will be bust in the second half of the fantasy season. If you guys did enjoy today's video, would really appreciate it if you did hit that like button and subscribe if you're new. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you on the next one.